This is the first lecture on fluoroscopy and interventional imaging. In this lecture, we shall learn about image intensifier system components. We shall also learn about the geometry of the fluoroscopy setup and the different configurations of acquisition systems. We shall focus on the image intensifier and learn about how images are acquired. We shall learn about a few artifacts connected to the use of an image intensifier in fluoroscopy image acquisition. Let's start by answering a basic question. What is fluoroscopy? Fluoroscopy is a real-time imaging procedure that allows the viewing of patient anatomy with high temporal resolution. It can be used for positioning and diagnosis of dynamic processes. In older fluoroscopes, the radiologist looked directly at an intensifying screen placed in front of the patient while the X-ray tube was operated behind the patient. Even with high exposures, images were very dim and required the radiologist's eyes to be dark adapted. These pictures show the setup used for imaging patients. The right image shows a radiologist looking through a fluoroscope at his hands. The X-ray tube was placed behind the location of the hand and directed X-rays at the entrance to the fluoroscope. These X-rays directly irradiated the eyes of the radiologist. In the other images, the radiologist will be looking at the imaging screen in a dark room as the X-ray was being operated behind the patient. So with that history in mind, Let's look at a few general principles of fluoroscopy imaging. In modern fluoroscopy machines, an image intensifier is used to brighten the image and improve image visibility. Images are also displayed on a TV screen. Because of image intensification, detectors used in modern fluoroscopy are several thousand times more sensitive than radiographic image receptors. This means we can use less radiation per image for fluoroscopy compared to general radiography. Compared to general radiography, fluoroscopy has poor signal-to-noise ratio but good temporal resolution. Images displayed at 30 frames per second on a TV screen are considered real-time imaging. This is equivalent to older analog television frames that provide the appearance of continuous motion. In many situations, the fluoroscope is operated by the radiologist, so it is important for radiologists to know how the system operates, what factors influence patient dose, and ways to minimize exposure to patient and staff. Basic components of a fluoroscopy system are listed here. The system has a high voltage generator or power supply, an X-ray tube, an X-ray image receptor which also intensifies the image, and a video camera. Let's look at individual system components. Fluoroscopy systems have an X-ray tube, both inherent and added filters, collimation, grids, an automatic brightness control system or automatic exposure rate compensation, and also compensating filters. The bottom figure shows the parts of the fluoroscopy system. On the next slide, we shall start with the X-ray tube. On the X-ray tube side of image acquisition, fluoroscopy machines have a tube inset containing an anode and cathode. X-rays are produced when accelerated electrons from the cathode strike the anode. X-rays are filtered as they exit the tube port Filtration removes the low energy components from the beam. Added filtration improves beam quality. Different filters are used in different imaging tasks. Filters are made of various thicknesses of copper and aluminum depending on the usage. For example, cat labs typically use between 0.1 and 0.3 mm copper filters on fluoroscopy acquisitions to reduce patient dose. Outside of the tube port, the X-ray beam is restricted to the anatomy of interest by collimating the beam. Collimators are usually of the variable aperture type we saw earlier in general X-ray imaging. Because fluoroscopy machines are made with the image receptor and X-ray tube mounted on the same support, they are aligned with each other. Image receptors must intercept the primary beam. This is checked by measuring the primary barrier transmission rate. The primary barrier transmission rate is measured by placing a handheld X-ray detector behind the primary barrier while the fluoroscope is in operation. In this image, you can see that the primary beam is larger than the displayed field of view, but is still within the image intensifier input surface. On the image receptor side, once X-rays pass through the patient and before reaching the image receptor, a grid is used to remove scatter X-rays produced by the patient and to improve contrast in the image. These grids work the same way as grids used in general radiography. Positioning of the grid is shown on this slide. The presence of grid increases patient dose. 
an important function of fluoroscopy imaging is maintaining image brightness and signal to noise ratio for different anatomies or thicknesses. Image brightness and signal to noise ratio are maintained by what is called an automatic brightness control or ABC system. ABC ensures that more radiation is used to penetrate thicker or denser anatomy and less radiation is used for thinner anatomy. ABC in fluoroscopy is like the AEC system we saw in general radiography. A sensor on the output side of the image intensifier detects light output and compares it to a reference. Differences between the light output and the reference triggers a feedback circuit that causes the generator to adjust KV or MA or both. This image shows how a thicker anatomy is imaged with higher MA to maintain the image brightness. The bottom figure shows how predetermined curves can be used to maintain image brightness by increasing KV, MA or both. Many fluoroscopy systems have several options to adjust dose and image quality. These are often labeled as low dose, medium dose or high dose selections on the console. These labels are manufacturer specific and are called different things on different machines. Automatic Exposure Rate Control or AERC is another name for ABC. AERC uses a sensor on the image intensifier input side or flat panel detector input side to maintain a constant input dose rate to the image intensifier or flat panel detector despite thickness or density variations in the path of the beam. More advanced systems use a control voltage derived from the video signal to control the dose rate. Additional control parameters are pulse length, added filtration, and variable aperture settings. This figure shows a few practical adjustment curves that can be selected by a user. Let's look at a few acquisition modes. Fluoroscopy can be acquired in a continuous mode or a pulsed mode. In continuous fluoroscopy, the machine produces a continuous X-ray beam of 0.5 to 6 mA tube current. A video camera displays images with a frame rate of 30 frames per second. This means image duration per frame is about 1 30th of a second or 33 milliseconds. For slow moving objects, fewer pulses per second can be used. Pulse widths indicate the exposure duration for each pulse. Pulse widths range from 3 to 10 milliseconds. Pulse fluoroscopy offers better image quality for fast moving objects but at a lower dose than a continuous setting. High dose modes are available for thicker anatomies when the regular mode is insufficient to produce adequate image quality. In some systems, high dose modes are called boost modes because they boost the MA up to about 20 mA for some applications. In record or cine modes, in cat labs, some units can produce up to 600 mA. Compensating filters are often used in general radiography to equalize or flatten images of non-uniform anatomies. In fluoroscopy, it is possible to use compensating filters to equalize images. Different shaped filters can be used for different anatomies. With modern fluoroscopy machines, this is often automatically done by using an extended dynamic range compensating system that minimizes the displayed gray level difference between the extremes of exposure. This scheme reduces dynamic range but also maintains the signal-to-noise ratio in the underpenetrated regions. On this slide, I have images of how a compensating filter can equalize an image if an automatic means is not available for image equalization. The unequalized image is shown on the top left and the equalized image is shown on the top right. An image of the equalization filter is shown on the bottom right. On the next few slides, we shall look at various fluoroscopy configurations and geometries. Fluoroscopy tubes like radiographic tubes have different focal spot sizes due to having a dual filament. Magnification is possible due to the geometry or by electronic means. Configurations used in fluoroscopy involve either an under-table or over-table x-ray tube. C-arm systems are found in surgery and in pain clinics and O-arms are found in surgery. We shall later look at special installations used for interventional radiology cardiac catheterizations and electrophysiology. Let's start with focal spots and magnification on the next slide. Fluoroscopy systems are often equipped with a dual focus cathode. The focal spot sizes range from 0.3 mm to 1 mm. The cathode is also equipped with a grid control to allow for pulsing of the X-ray beam at the anode. Image magnification in fluoroscopy is different from radiography. 
In radiography, we could move the patient along the SOD. In some cases, we can also do that in fluoroscopy, but often we want the SOD to be as long as possible to reduce patient dose. So magnification is often controlled by using magnification modes provided on the operator console. Fluoroscopic imaging systems can be configured in several ways. The most common is the configuration in which the X-ray tube is located under the patient table and the image intensifier and auxiliary imaging equipment are on a movable tower above the patient table. Lead curtains hanging from the image intensifier tower shield the operator from scatter radiation from the patient. You can commonly find the setup shown on the left in the GI imaging applications. The setup on the right where the tube is over the table and the image intensifier is under table is often found in GU imaging applications. Another type of fluoroscopy system commonly used in operating rooms is the mobile C-arm system. In this configuration, the X-ray tube and image intensifier are mounted on a C-shaped arm. The SID is fixed and there is no dedicated table. The C-arm is capable of multiple degrees of freedom, including rotations, raising and lowering, and telescopic functions. Some C-arms are capable of 3D rotations to acquire tomographic images. Special mini C-arm systems are often used for extremity work. C-arms are also used for pain management where they can be used to guide needle placement for injections. Another type of configuration is the O-arm imaging system. O-arms are used in the operating rooms for guiding surgery applications like screw placements. The system is capable of imaging in 2D mode as a fluoroscope or in 3D mode to produce tomographic images. In 2D mode, the doses are comparable to other fluoroscopy applications. On this slide, the O-arm is shown open to act as a C-arm or closed for 3D acquisitions. Dual tube and dual image intensifier systems are found in cardiovascular and interventional radiology suites. These systems are capable of rotation to create a tomographic image like a CT image that can be used for navigation and guidance. We shall learn more about them later. The images here show two biplane units for catheterization and a single plane for electrophysiology. The image intensifier is an important component in the fluoroscopy system. In the next few slides, we shall learn about the image intensifier structure, gain, field of view, and a few artifacts connected to structure and geometry of image intensifier systems. Let's start with the image intensifier on the next slide. The image receptor in fluoroscopy imaging is part of an image intensifier system. An image intensifier not only converts the X-rays into a visible image, it also increases the image brightness by about 10,000 times for better visibility while using only a few X-rays. Depending on the size of the image intensifier, field of view diameters can range from 6 inches to 16 inches. Different field of views are used when imaging different body parts. The image created at the output is about 1 inch in diameter and is recorded by a video camera. The figure here shows a cutout section of a typical image intensifier. The image intensifier consists of a glass vacuum enclosure placed in an aluminum housing. The input window of the image intensifier is curved to withstand the external pressure due to the vacuum within it. There are four layers in the input screen. First is a vacuum window, second a support layer, third an input phosphor, and fourth a photocathode. Let's look at the input screen in more detail next. The first layer in an image intensifier is a vacuum window. This is a thin aluminum window that protects the glass vacuum enclosure. The second layer is a support layer consisting of the input phosphor and photocathode. The input phosphor is the third layer and plays the role of the screen as in general radiographic imaging. It converts X-ray photons into light photons. The input phosphor is typically made of cesium iodide crystals grown in needle-like columns. It is a layer that is about 400 microns thick. Because of its sensitivity to X-rays, one X-ray photon results in about 3,000 light photons being produced. The figure illustrates the nature of the cesium iodide layer. The photocathode is the fourth layer and converts light photons from the cesium iodide input phosphor into electrons by means of the photoelectric effect. It is made of antimony and alkali metals and has a conversion efficiency of 10 to 20 percent. For each X-ray photon absorbed, about 400 electrons are released. The top layer of this input phosphor illustration is the photocathode. Once electrons are released by the photocathode, 
They enter the vacuum chamber where they are accelerated by high potential differences of between 25 to 35 kilovolts applied across different electrodes. Electrodes shape and control the electron beam, forming what is called an electronic lens. Because of the increased electron speed due to the acceleration of the electrons by the electrodes, there is a so-called electronic gain or flux gain. The output phosphor diameter is about 1 inch compared to the input phosphor diameter of between 6 to 16 inches. The output phosphor absorbs the high energy electrons and emits visible light. It is made of zinc cadmium sulfide doped with silver. For each electron absorbed, about 1000 light photons are released. The high spatial resolution of the output phosphor is because it contains 1 to 2 micron sized particles in a 4 to 8 micron thick layer and has a diameter of 1 inch. The output phosphor is coated onto a glass window. The illustration shows the output phosphor structure and function. The image at the output phosphor is reduced because of the size difference between the input and output phosphors. This reduction leads to light amplification because the light collected at an input phosphor of say 6 inches is concentrated onto an output phosphor of 1 inch. This is called minification gain. Minification gain is the ratio of the input phosphor to output phosphor areas. There is more minification gain if the input phosphor is 16 inches compared to a 6 inch input phosphor. Let's look at how magnification is accomplished in an image intensifier system. In an image intensifier, there are several magnification modes, normal mode, first level magnification, second level magnification, and so on. We shall see later when we learn about special imaging applications that some fluoroscopy systems having digital flat panels can have up to eight levels of magnification. In an image intensifier, magnification is achieved by using electrodes to focus the electrons as they travel from the cathode to the anode. This is shown on the lower left image. The focal spot location determines the magnification of the object. Focal spots closer to the output produce normal mode. Focal spots farther from the output produce magnification. We will learn later how magnification modes increase patient dose. On the next few slides, we shall learn about image intensifier performance specifications like brightness gain, conversion factor, and contrast ratio. Brightness gain is defined as minification gain multiplied by electronic gain or flux gain. Minification gain results from the reduction of a large X-ray image at the input phosphor to a smaller diameter output phosphor. Minification gain is defined as the ratio of areas or the ratio of input diameter squared divided by output diameter squared. A typical minification gain for a 9-inch input phosphor is 81. Minification gain is largest when there is a large difference between the input phosphor size and the output phosphor size. When magnification view is used, minification gain is reduced. Magnification views require higher radiation exposure levels to make up for lower minification gain. The second parameter in the brightness gain formula is electronic gain. Electronic gain is kinetic energy gained by electrons from acceleration. It is a measure of light produced at output phosphor compared to input phosphor. It is also called flux gain. Flux gain is equal to light photons at output divided by light photons at input phosphor. Typical flux gain is about 50. We can calculate total brightness gain from the minification gain of 81 from the previous slide multiplied by the electronic or flux gain of 50 to get a total of 4050. The next performance specification is conversion factor. Conversion factor is defined as the luminance at the output phosphor divided by input exposure rate. The unit of luminance is candela per unit area and the unit of exposure rate is millirongen per second. Typical conversion factors for a 9-inch image intensifier is 100 to 300 candela per square meter per millirongen per second. Conversion factor diminishes with age and use by about 5 to 10 percent per year for image intensifiers. The last performance specification is contrast ratio. Contrast ratio is a measurement of the amount of veiling glare present in the image. It is measured by imaging a LED disc and measuring luminance of the disc and comparing to another image area without a LED disc in place. Typical contrast ratio is 20 to 1 to 30 to 1. Contrast ratio decreases with age and use. In a fluoroscopy system based on an image intensifier and a TV camera, the spatial resolution can be separated into a vertical and a horizontal component. Vertical resolution is the number of active strips per frame multiplied by the Kell factor. 
The curl factor is a fraction of active sweeps that are effective in preserving detail in the image. Active sweeps are about 93% of the possible lines. Horizontal resolution has additional factors shown in the formula. The overall spatial resolution of the imaging system is limited by the capabilities of the TV system coupled to the image intensifier. This table shows what you can expect for the spatial resolution of a TV system for a given field of view. Artifacts in fluoroscopic imaging usually stem from image distortions caused by components of the image chain. For image intensifiers, there are a few artifacts we can learn about. When we learn about flat panel image receptors later, we shall see that these distortions will not be present. We shall next look in detail at each artifact listed here. Veiling glare appears as a haze in the image and reduces contrast. Veiling glare is caused by scattering of electrons within the electron optical system and scatter of light photons within the glass output window. Such stray light reflected inside the output window contributes to veiling glare. A thick clear glass output window is used to absorb internally scattered light. The sides of the glass window is coated with a light absorbing material. In some cases, the optical coupling system is replaced by a fiber optic light guide. This picture shows veiling glare in an image intensifier system compared to a flat panel detector system. Pin cushion distortion is due to the uneven magnification between the center and edges of the image and is caused by projecting a curved image onto a flat surface. These images show the appearance of pin cushion distortion. Vignetting is an optical distortion that produces a fall off of light intensity or darkening near the edges of an image. Typical fall off in image brightness is 20 to 30% for a 23 cm image intensifier in normal mode. It can be caused by several factors, including deterioration of the video camera. It is also inherent in multi element lenses. Vignetting can be reduced in some cases by restricting the aperture size. Magnetic fields from the Earth and other stray magnetic fields cause electrons traveling through the image intensifier to be deflected. This appears on a video monitor display as an S shaped distortion. S shaped distortion can be minimized by proper site planning and by placing the image intensifier in a high susceptibility metal to shield it from stray magnetic fields. S shaped distortion is shown on this slide. Blooming is caused by the input of signals to the video camera that exceed its dynamic range. Such large signals cause lateral charge spreading within the camera target, resulting in a diffuse image that is larger than the original. This can be minimized by using tight X-ray beam collimation. Let's finish with a few questions. When stray magnetic fields act on the electron beam in an image intensifier, the resulting artifact is called, and your choices are, a. Blooming B. S-shaped distortion C. Vignetting D. Pain cushion distortion The correct choice is B. S-shaped distortion Next question. During fluoroscopy, which of these actions would decrease patient's dose? Your choices are A. Inserting a grid B. Using magnification C. Using boost mode D using pause mode instead of continuous mode. The correct choice is D, using pause mode instead of continuous mode. Next question, identify the parts of the fluoroscopic imaging chain shown. The correct choices are shown here. A is camera electronics. B, image intensifier. C, anti-scatter grid. D, collimator. E, X-ray tube. This is the last slide of the presentation. Thank you for watching.